Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5 on Heredity. This is video number 20. We're going to explore some aspects of autosomal inheritance. So this is where we start to move on from our kind of general look at modelling the formation of the genotypes produced during meiosis to start looking at some of the uh, specific patterns of inheritance that relate to Mendel's laws. So you should understand what this idea of autosomal inheritance is all about. Uh, we're going to introduce you to this idea of solving genetic problems and hopefully that will link in with some of what you already know or may have experienced in year 10 and also to be able to solve a range of genetic problems which include both monohybrid and dihybrid crosses. Now I will say one thing. Now I will say one thing. Dihybrid crosses are not specifically identified in the um, syllabus, but when you're talking about autosomal inheritance, we're not going to make the assumption that there's only one gene on each chromosome, which of course there isn't. It's probably closer to about a thousand. So that means that there are going to be some interactions between them. Now, obviously, we can't look at what's going on with a thousand different genes because that's ridiculous. But to look at maybe more than one might be useful for you. So when you get to that section of the video, if you want to have a look, if you're interested, keep playing it. Otherwise, stop it at that point and make sure that you're strong and you feel comfortable to be able to solve at least these monohybrid cross problems. And we're going to look at some variations in these uh, ratios as we go further into this particular topic. But for now, uh, let's just have a little bit of a look at the work of Mendel. So Gregor Mendel is the father of genetics. He is the one who has put together all of these great ideas because he was a, a monk who worked in a monastery. Um, he had a lot of time on his hands, but he also didn't have a scientific background. So a lot of his work remained um, undiscovered, or at least the um, full value of what he did remained um, unidentified and unrecognized for quite a long period of time. He came up with this idea of the particulate theory, okay, that there's little bits and pieces somewhere inside of us that codes for different characteristics, inherited patterns, inherited traits. And he used peas, so he used pea plants. And that's why um, you'll see lots of examples involving pea plants because that's what Mendel looked at. And he looked at lots of different characteristics of the pea plants as well. He didn't just look at one. So you can see the seeds themselves, so these would be the peas, can either be nice and round and spherical or they can be slightly wrinkled. They can be yellow, which you may not have had much experience with. You probably mostly had green peas. Uh, the colour of the flowers could be white or pur of purple, violet. The pods themselves that the peas are sitting inside of, they could have a kind of full or a constricted form and again also be yellow or green. Um, and we also look at things like the height of the plants themselves, tall or short, and also some aspects about the flowers in terms of whether they're what we call axial or terminal. So you can see there's lots of different um, characteristics here. And the interesting thing about these is they are uh, uh, all examples of autosomal inheritance. So let's just be really clear about that. Um, Basically, if it's not autosomal, then it relates to the sex or gender. So we know that there are 46 chromosomes in humans. There are 23 pairs. 22 of those pairs are basically autosomal. And only one pair, an XX uh, for females and an XY for males, uh, are not autosomal. So these are all characteristics, genes that have been coded for in these other, if you like, the 22 chromosomes that are not X's or Y's. And you'll see why there's a difference when we talk about genes that are inherited on the sex chromosomes in later videos. So Mendel's work was um, very, very important, primarily because he was really quintessentially an outstanding scientist. What he did was he, he got uh, pure breeding parents, so he was able to make sure that they were uh, breeding with just one particular trait coming through for whatever it was he was looking at. He kept very accurate records, and we know that in science, data is king. So uh, data is very, very important. We need to keep good, accurate 
uh, and comprehensive records. Gregor Mendel was able to separate the generations and he was actually able to manipulate the reproductive uh, process in a way that allowed him to have some level of control. He also made sure that he counted each number and type of offspring. And again, the fact that he kept such accurate records made it a lot easier for him to actually identify some of these really important patterns. And from his work, we've learned quite a lot about the patterns of inheritance and some very important Mendelian ratios. So as I mentioned, the important things that we're going to look at in terms of autosomal inheritance is they relate to the autosomal chromosome. So not, um, not X, X, or X, Y. So we'll have a look at um, these in a little bit more detail later. But basically, we're talking about not these ones. So any of the other genes, any of the other sequences of DNA that are carried on any of the other chromosomes that code for particular proteins that allow those to be expressed in some way that we can physically see them uh, or measure them, then they are autosomal um, genes. And as a result, we can, we can look at the patterns of inheritance. Genes come in usually more than one form, and those different forms or variants we call alleles, and alleles is another very important term that we're going to be using a lot uh, in this little section. So alleles are variations. So if you think about the colour um, of the flowers, um, purple colour or white colour, we usually um, show these different alleles, so that is not the actual flower itself, but the information in the gene that codes for the flower colour as a particular letter. Often we use these um, capital and lowercase or uppercase and lowercase letters. And there's particular reasons for that related to um, a, a, an important thing, which, which is called dominance, which we'll look at uh, in this video as well. Usually the colours of the flowers are going to in some way relate to the um, particular trait that's being expressed. Um, not always, sometimes it's a little more difficult, um, but like algebra, you can use any letter you like as long as you understand uh, what they mean. And often it's useful when you're doing these sorts of problems, when you're solving these sort of genetic problems, to have a little key somewhere so that we can follow exactly what it is that you are using for uh, each trait. So we're going to get two alleles for each of these different genes. One we're going to inherit from our mother and one from the father. Now, they can be the same, so we can get the same allele from mum and dad. Uh, in this case, if they're the same, we call them homozygous. So zygous from zygote, which is the fertilised egg. So this is where the two genes are coming back together. So we've said meiosis separates the genes out into the uh, gametes the sperm and the egg, and then fertilization brings them back together again. So in this case, we now have, uh, say, a big B, big B, or a little B, little B. So that's one big B from mum, one big B from dad, or one little B from mum, one little B from dad, and they would be homozygous. Now, if you get different ones, so a big B from mum, a little B from dad, or vice versa, then we're talking hetero, hetero different zygous. So these are just some important terms. The thing about biology is there's a lot of terminology and you need to be able to not just understand it, but use it comfortably when you're um, solving problems and expressing your answers. What we need to do is we need to create something which is called a Punnett square. And this really is one for the mathematicians because it's like a multiplication grid. What we do is we identify, firstly, our parent generation. So the P generation, we usually will call a parent generation. Now, the thing about Mendel's experiments was that he made sure he had pure breeds. So if, for example, in this case, we're looking at flower colour and we're saying that the purple colour is dominant over the white, then we've given the purple colour the big B and the white colour, the little b. So in the situation where we have a pure breeding purple plant, that is homozygous big B, big B, and a pure breeding white flowered plant, that would be homozygous little b, little b. What we do then is we look at the um, possible gametes that could form. So again, this is a whole range of chromosomes that are going into the eggs or the sperm, but we're just concentrating on the little one that we're interested in, which in this case is the one that codes for the colour of the flower. 
So from this parent, we can only get a big B. And from this parent, we can only get a little B. So no matter which two gametes join together during fertilization, you can only get a big B, big B, uh, big B, little B. That's the only combination you can get from this parent generation. And we call that the, the next generation, if you like, the children of the parents, the F1. F is filial. The filial generation. So the first generation, all of the pea plants would have had purple flowers, all of them. So the big B, little B combination meant that the little B, the little allele that codes for white flowers, was actually being masked. Masked in F1. So it was present, but we didn't know it was there because it wasn't being expressed. And this is what I referred to earlier when I talked about dominant and recessive. Now we don't know which is dominant and which is recessive until we have a heterozygous condition. When we have a heterozygous condition, that is one big B, one little B, one allele that codes for purple flowers and one which codes for white flowers, that's when we know whether one of these is dominant or not. Because if one is dominant, that means that particular allele will be expressed, such as the purple flower, and the white one will be masked or not expressed. So it'll be carried, but you won't see it. What you will see, potentially, is it reappear in the next generation. And this was a really interesting finding of Mendel where certain traits seemed to disappear for a while and then to reappear. And that really countered a lot of the um, underlying uh, understanding of patterns of inheritance up till Mendel's time. We all thought it was about a blend. You just blended these and blended these and blended these and you couldn't ever get to something from previous generations that had disappeared. And yet here it was, that white flower disappeared in the F1 generation. None of the offspring had the white flowers, but then in the F2, the filial 2 generation, it reappeared. How did it reappear? Well, it reappeared because of what you see in this Punnett square here. A pollen from a male with this F1 generation, so these, remember, these are all big B, little Bs, big B, little Bs. So you're getting pollen from a male, which is landing on the pistil, the female part of the flower, and that um, little pollen tube grows in into the ovule, and it's going to fertilize the egg. And when it does, we've got these possible ranges of gametes. So this here is the gametes. Again, the difference this time is because both of these individuals are big B, little b, they can either put in a big B into a gamete or a little b for the male and a big B or a little b into the gamete for the female, which means, and this is about probability, we need to work out what all the possible combinations are. So we multiply these just like we would in a multiplication grid. And so we get one big B, big B. We get two big B, little Bs. And we get one little B, little B. And so that's what's over here. Okay. In fact, we're going to continue on with the horrible terminology and I'm going to give you two more. The first one here, I'll call this one. One is a genotypic ratio. Okay, genotype is like genes. What's in the genes? What's in the genes is um, a possibility of one big B, big B, to two big B, little Bs, to one little B, little B. Now think about these, this aspect of genetics like throwing a coin, because that's what this is. This is probability. If you throw a coin, you've got 50% chance of getting heads and 50% chance of getting tails. That doesn't mean if you throw the coin and you get a head that the next throw has to be a tail to make it 50-50. Every time you throw it, it's still 50-50. But you could get a run of three heads in a row. That's the same thing with genetics. This is predictive. This is allowing us to see what the possible combinations could be and the fact that there may be a higher likelihood of one particular type of gene being expressed or an allele being expressed than another 
more often in the offspring. But it's still just probability. So there's no guarantees. It's not going to be exact. And in fact, when Mendel did these experiments, the ratios worked out very close to these ratios that we're looking at here. We just didn't um, get them bang on. And experimentally, we wouldn't expect to get them absolutely bang on for thousands of different um, crosses. So what you have to do then from your genotypic ratio is you need to infer or interpret the next one, which is the phenotypic ratio. And uh, phenotypes are like the physical characteristics. So they're what we can see. So in actual fact, when we do all these genetic crosses, we don't know what's big Bs and little Bs and all of that sort of stuff. We don't know any of that. We've used a model to help us understand that. What we do know is what colour the flowers are. We can see what colour the flowers are. We can count the numbers of purple flowers and white flowers. We can count the number of green peas and yellow peas and wrinkled pods and round pods. We can see all of those characteristics and therefore we can measure them or we can count them in some way. It's the phenotypic ratio. And in fact, this is exactly what Mendel found. When he did these experiments, he found that if he started with pure breeding parents, in the first generation from those parents, they all had the dominant trait. And in the second generation, it was three dominant to one recessive. They were the ratios. And those Mendelian ratios are going to be very important. We'll use them in our summary. The problem with autosomal uh, inheritance is this. When you are looking at the homozygous condition, that is a big B, big B, or a little b, little b, the interpretation is easy, okay? Because there's only one type of allele, so therefore that's the only thing that can be expressed. The problem that we have is the heterozygous condition. In the heterozygous condition, we have a number of ways of interpreting that. And here are some important questions, and I'm not going to answer all of these now, but they're ones that we need to look at over the subsequent videos. Firstly, does one dominate over the other? And we've just talked about an example with flower colour in peas of autosomal dominance. Sometimes both are expressed, and we call that co-dominance. Sometimes there's an intermediate between the two, so neither is expressed, but neither is masked, and we call that incomplete dominance. We've also looked at the fact that because this is autosomal inheritance, there is actually a pattern of inheritance that occurs on those X and Y chromosomes. Are they the same or different? What is the interpretation if alleles are located on the sex chromosomes? Can you have more than two? Well, yes, you can have more than two, and blood grouping is an example of that, where we actually have three different alleles, A, B, and O. Can we carry out experiments? That is, can we try and predict what will happen in the future? Or do we need to examine historical data? Now, historical data is the sort of thing that you might do if you were going to buy a pedigree pet. Um, you can't breed future. What you have to do is look at where your prospective pet has come from. So you, you look historically back. What was the characteristics of its parents and the parents of those parents? And we do the same thing with our own ancestry as well. We also do that where we can't ethically carry out experiments or because they take a long time. And are we examining one trait at a time, which is what we call a mono, one, hybrid cross, or two traits, which is a dihybrid cross? When we look at our Mendelian ratios, what we look at is the fact that in monohybrid crosses, our genotypic ratios are one to two to one, and our phenotypic ratios are three to one in favour of the dominant trait over the recessive trait. Now, I haven't looked at this here, and I think given the timing for this video, I will add an extra video looking a little bit uh, at dihybrid crosses. But just to give you a short uh, introduction to that, the dihybrid cross ratio is 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. The difference here is that we actually have di, 2. So we have two traits that we put together, and it just makes those tables a little bit bigger and a little bit more complex. Um, but the practice of following them in terms of Punnett squares is exactly the same. This has been a big video. Thanks for staying with it. Hopefully you've been able to uh, go quickly through this and see the key uh, takeaway points. And thanks for watching.